We'll finish this chapter out by looking a little bit more specifically at energy considerations. And bioenergetics is um, a word that, that refers to the flow of energy in living systems. So we're gonna be sort of looking at where does the energy start and then where does it end up going? So um, to get us going on this, we're going to, to touch on a couple of laws from thermodynamics. A lot of what we understand about energy has come out of this field of thermodynamics. And there are some laws that have been um, stated by thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics, which you've probably heard of before, very famous, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Rather, it can only be transformed. So we can modify it um, from one form to another, but we're not actually creating or destroying it in the process. The second law of thermodynamics says that each time we transform energy, we're going to lose some in the form of heat. And when we do this, when we carry out an energy transformation, um, what happens is that heat usually goes into the system surroundings and we say that it increases the entropy of the system. Entropy is a measurement of disorganization, how disorderly something is. Um, so if you heat up the environment, you're increasing the entropy because the molecules are like, they're wiggling more and they're moving around more. So there's, um, there's less order in, that, in the surroundings. In the context of living things, where do we start with all of this? So where does our energy come from? Ultimately, it comes from the sun. And what happens is plants, things that can photosynthesize, um, can take in some of that light energy and they can carry out a transformation on it. So it starts as light energy and then it gets transformed by the plant through the process of photosynthesis, gets transformed into chemical energy. And it's the chemical energy that's tied into the bonds of a molecule. And the molecule that the plant makes is sugar, it's glucose. Okay, so the plant uses these um, starting ingredients. These are the products um, sorry, these are the reactants right here. And then this um, up here, these are the products of the reaction. So in terms of energy, uh, the energy transformations that are taking place here, once this sugar molecule is formed, this is something that we might ingest, right? We might eat a plant, we might eat a potato, get some of the starch that it has, has stored, and then we might break that down um, into its smaller subunits. So let's just start with a sugar molecule and think about breaking it down in the human body. Okay, so we start right here. We start with a molecule that has a lot of energy stored in it. And what's gonna happen is our enzymes are gonna break it down sort of one step at a time. Remember, metabolic pathway. Each time a reaction takes place to break it down, a little bit of the energy gets released into the system, into the surroundings. This is why we generate heat, right? We, our bodies generate heat. That's because of all the reactions that are taking place internally. So what's happening with the sugar molecule as it gets broken down, this is an example of an exergonic reaction. This name right here, exergonic reaction. This means that energy is being released in the process. And in the end, the products that we make down here, the products that we make have less energy than the reactants that we started with. That's an exergonic reaction. An endergonic reaction would be just the opposite. So this is like what the plants do. The plants use these as the reactants, the starting materials, and they build them up. They connect them together. So it's going the other way in order to end up with this as the final product. That would be an endergonic reaction. So two different types of reactions. In our bodies, it turns out that a lot of times these two different types of reactions are coupled together. Okay, so we can use an exergonic reaction, one that releases energy, in order to drive an endergonic reaction. And this gets, this is really fascinating. This is interesting. This is probably something you haven't heard about before. So feel free to take your time with, with these concepts here. Um, okay, so we get energy from food, right? We break down food molecules. That's an exergonic reaction. And that exergonic reaction is going to drive other things to take place in our bodies. And a lot of times the way that this occurs is through a molecule called ATP, the energy molecule of our bodies. Okay, so ATP, adenosine triphosphate, this is a molecule that's really good at storing energy temporarily. 
um, in its bonds. So this is the structure of ATP. Notice how it has three phosphate groups here. These bonds between the phosphate groups, these are where most of the energy is stored. And um, we can cleave off a phosphate in order to release a large amount of energy from this molecule. Okay, so ATP, this is sort of viewed as the universal energy carrier in our bodies that powers a lot of things. Okay, so in practice what happens is when we break down food molecules, that energy that's released is harvested, it's stored in ATP molecules. Okay, so we, we'll be seeing this in the next chapter. Um, we generate ATP in the process of cellular, cellular respiration, and then those ATP molecules can be used to drive or power other processes in the body. So we'll come back to that again in more detail next week. Uh, the reaction types that are taking place here with regards to the ATP and other molecules, um, reactions are pretty much always coupled. There will be a reduction reaction. That's when a molecule gains an electron and that's coupled with an oxidation reaction in which a molecule loses an electron. So reduction versus oxidation, you'll want to know the difference between these two. Okay, oxidation, um, so there's a saying that kind of goes along with this. That if you don't know the saying already, let me get my pen and I'll jot it down here. So the saying is, Leo says grr. Okay, so Leo, like a lion, Leo the lion says grr. And what this is standing for is loss of electrons is oxidation. Okay, so if a molecule loses electrons, then it's been oxidized. And over here, gain of electrons is reduction. If a molecule gains electrons, it has been reduced. Okay, Leo says grr. All right, so usually when a reaction takes place, if there are two molecules involved, usually one of them gives up an electron and hands it off to the other one. Okay, so one molecule gets oxidized, the other is getting reduced. When this happens, when electrons are passed from one molecule to another, a lot of times it's not just an electron, but a lot of times a hydrogen, a hydrogen ion tends to sort of go with it. Okay, so if a negatively charged electron moves from one molecule to another, a positively charged hydrogen ion is, is probably gonna jump along with it. So we'll be talking about um, electron carriers. We'll also be talking about proton carriers. A lot of times they're one in the same. And particularly the hydrogen carrier molecule that we'll be interested in most is going to be NAD. This is an example of a coenzyme. Um, NAD is a molecule that can have two different states. This is its oxidized state. It has lost electrons um, in this state. And what it can do is take on a couple of electrons as well as a hydrogen. Okay, so it, can, it acts as a hydrogen carrier when it's in this state, NADH. Um, this is a, like a hydrogen shuttle. It carries, uh, it carries electrons and hydrogen from one location to another in the cell. Another hydrogen carrier molecule is FAD. This one also has an oxidized form and a reduced form. Okay, so here it is um, missing some electrons. Here it is in its reduced state. It has gained some electrons and also a couple of hydrogens have popped on as well. So again, those are examples of coenzymes. We introduced this word earlier in the chapter. Here's an example, and these are examples that we will be seeing in the next chapter. Let's take a look at NADH just to finish this out. NADH in a little bit more detail. These are, this is good practice just to think about these words, oxidized versus reduced. Okay, so here we have NAD. This is in an oxidized form. What it can do is pick up some electrons and hydrogens from this molecule. So it's taking them away. In the process, it becomes reduced. So this is the oxidized form, this is the reduced form. In the process, 
Um, here's another phrase to be aware of. It's acting as an oxidizing agent. Um, so this molecule is forcing this one to lose electrons. So it's acting as an oxidizing agent. Meanwhile, it itself is becoming reduced. And that's worth taking a, taking a minute uh, to make sure you're okay with, with the application of those words. The reaction can go in the other direction too. NADH can give up its electrons and proton and um, become NAD. So in that case, it's donating electrons over here to this guy. This one becomes reduced and this molecule becomes oxidized. 